I'm Kamali Melbourne, and this is the Sky News Daily. Now, today's topic is one that has long fascinated me. My family are Jamaican. I was born there and came here as a toddler. I've been back many times. Some have spent at my grandparents' house as some of my happiest memories. I'm also fascinated by the region's history, a place where people, my ancestors, were forcibly taken. As I've gotten older, read more, learnt more, I want to understand the impact of the largest forced migration in human history. 300, 400 years later, and in particular over that colonial period, we don't value the places and the spaces and the cultures that we come from, our heritage. The call for reparations from nations in which chattel slavery operated is not new. Intellectually, it's as old as the end of the trade itself in the 19th century. Reparatory justice was given a framework in 2014 when Caribbean nations, collectively known as CARICOM, adopted a 10-point plan laying out what is needed for the victims of transatlantic slavery and their descendants. Now in 2023, three years after the world's eyes were opened to racial injustice in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, those calls may be beginning to be heard. The Dutch government and royal family have apologised for the Netherlands' part in slavery, beginning to make payments for its role in the trade. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, head of the Church of England, says it's now time for the church to take action to address what he says is our shameful past. And the new king, Charles III, has expressed sorrow and support for research into the Crown's links to slavery. So where do these calls and campaigns go next? In this episode, we're going to speak to a man who may be an unlikely champion of reparations and reparatory justice, a telecoms billionaire from Ireland who's taken the campaign on, and ask him why it's so important. Countries got their independence in the 60s and 70s, the cupboard were bare. All of these countries never had a chance to get off the floor. But first, let's hear from those in the Caribbean. Dr. Angelique Nixon was born in the Bahamas and now teaches at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. She's the author of Resisting Paradise, Tourism, Diaspora and Sexuality in Caribbean Culture. Growing up in the Bahamas, our system of education, even in the post-independence era when I grew up, still very much is rooted in a colonial understanding of history. And I always say when I talk about education, I learned more about the Caribbean region when I left and I was on scholarship and abroad at university in the U.S. I learned more about Caribbean history in my studies, but I didn't understand the larger historical context until I began to study Uh, Honestly, and I think that's a big part of the problem, our education systems across the Caribbean actually fail us. And it's why I don't think have the the levels of rage we need. Chattel slavery, the system that was in place, and let's deal with the sort of the socioeconomic impact now and how people in the Caribbean now are, are still having to live with the things that happened 200 years ago. It's hard to say one thing, colonialism as a structure, coloniality as an ideology, as a belief system, continuously impacts our social institutions, our legal frameworks, our governments, how we operate, and more insidiously, our education, our educational systems, the structures, how Western thought has been, especially through British imperialism and colonialism, was elevated all over all other ways of being and thinking so that You know, now, 300, 400 years later, we don't value the the places and the spaces and the cultures that we come from, our heritage. You know, we grow up hating and, and not understanding our own legacy. But I think that's why when you look at the CARICOM 10 point plan, you'll notice there are specific points about investment in education, about social reformation programs, about preserving through museums and through different educational and cultural preservation, you know, aspects of particularly African and indigenous and Asian ancestral legacies that we see across the Caribbean. But I want to give a specific example. When we think about tourism as deeply embedded in a foreign investment, it's all we become overly, the Caribbean region is one of the most dependent regions in the world on tourism. Some countries' GDPs are as high as 50%, right, from the tourism industry. It relies on one 
product. And if anything happens, any shock, any disaster, any decision by another country, oh, that, you know, this country is not quote unquote safe to go to, it completely devastates economies. Without tourism, though, in the Caribbean, how would the economies survive? Is that somewhere where the, this idea of restorative justice can kind of can come in and, and play a part? Absolutely. I think that's exactly why when reparations, conversations and, you know, campaigns around reparations are very clear that we need solid investment back into Caribbean institutions, education, agriculture. You'll notice that there's a, a repetition around some of these arguments. Agriculture, education, governments to have clear investment and to get rid of in all of its forms, the whole idea of structural adjustment, where we are being told by external forces that we have to not invest in our social programs. We absolutely need those. And it's an outright, it's so, so infuriating that these programs have spent the last 30 years telling Caribbean governments that they can't invest in people. We have to invest in our people. We have to deal with the historical injustices of a lack of education and a lack of investment in our own societies, our own culture. So I think that's at the heart of it. Some people might say, well, where is this money going to come from and why? There have been so many studies, the legacies of British slave ownership, the monies that were literally paid out by British taxpayer dollars to British slave owners and plantation owners. Billions of dollars, right? There is a clear line of money. It actually has been traced. Those monies were invested in what has created the United Kingdom, what has continued to sustain British power and and the power of resources, the power of the means of production, the power to control and invest and, and increase the wealth that was created. There are very clear lines. And so there's no longer this question of, oh, we can't figure it out. We can absolutely figure it out. We know where the money went. <laughs> now, there is a difference in how people view slavery, perhaps not in its horror, but certainly in the emotional long-term scarring of such a system on people descended from those that were victims of it and those that were not. And that difference in thought may well be exacerbated by the way we're taught about the trade in school. Angelique mentioned the impact and importance of education across the Caribbean in helping its citizens understand their own history better. My generation grew up in a system where Trinidad was trying to decolonize the curriculum. This is Dr. Cassandra Gupta, a researcher from Trinidad and Tobago, now working in Britain on the study of slavery and its legacies. Our education system was inherited from the British. My parents grew up learning Cambridge and GCSE. But my generation, we learned a lot about revolutions, the Haitian revolutions. We learned about the punishment that the enslaved people were met with. We learned a lot, though, about resistance in terms of uprisings, but also how musical instruments were used, things like that. Things that I don't think are at the forefront of, you know, the education system in England. So we were taught for a different side. Yeah. So when I see people here in Britain criticizing that we're trying to change history, we're actually trying to tell the whole story. We're not trying to change history because what you learn in Britain about abolition is completely different from what we learn in the Caribbean. Just a quick example. My parents grew up hearing Christopher Columbus discovered Trinidad and Tobago. But my generation, it was changed to Christopher Columbus rediscovered Trinidad and Tobago. And I think now they're saying maybe he invaded. So it's constantly changing. Mm. But I was part of that decolonization. I mean, it's hugely important, right? Because what it gives you is is a sense of self, a a greater sense of self. I can tell you for certain that the British curriculum when I was coming up didn't teach us anything about black history. The only history we were taught about black people is that we were enslaved. It often occurs to me that had Black Britain's been taught a different history, how different our community would be right now. Why did you choose to become involved in reparations, restorative justice? My area is mainly looking at legacies of slavery research. During Black Lives Matter protests, I started seeing a lot more jobs popping up when Hmm. it comes to colonialism and slavery. So in real time, I saw change happening. And what I mean by that is looking at British institutions and sort of tracing their money doing self-investigations, finding out where their commodities came from or Mm -hmm. where their wealth came from. You trace this back 
specifically to Black Lives Matter and, and the and the killing of George Floyd. That's yeah. when you saw the yes. change. Was it white guilt? I think some of the movements to or the initiatives to look at this type of research, it is coming from a genuine place. But then you do have instances where people do it because they get pressure from their own staff or they want to tick the box and move on. So it's both. So it's 2023. We're a number of years on from from that moment, that yeah. sort of sense of reinvigoration, renewal, however you want to describe it. And now it's to take the next step. So what do you think it looks like in terms of restorative justice? What does that actually mean? I feel the next step that I would like to see is more engagement with descendant communities in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the Caribbean, no one has any idea it's going on. Hmm. No one really care. It's not at the forefront of their minds because, you know, they're looking at their own local news, things like that. So I feel like we need to have more knowledge exchange. We need to do more in terms of bridging that gap between the mm. two regions because it's so essential to getting their voices. It is the single biggest issue in the Caribbean mm -hmm. for governments, and but also for the entire population. This is Dennis O'Brien, and he's an interesting part of this story. He's an Irish billionaire and has many money-making ventures, not least through Digicel, a telecoms firm in the Caribbean. So why would someone so wealthy want to join the fight for reparations? Well, he is the founder of the Repair Campaign, calling for just that. I've been working in the Caribbean for more than 25 years. I've invested in 25 countries in that region. I've had loads of conversations with people over many, many years. And the biggest thing on their minds is reparatory justice, because they feel that when these countries got their independence, the cupboards were bare. They were never given the funding to properly develop their country, both socially and economically. Is it the single biggest issue? What, what happened with slavery? Is, or is it a connected to the poverty, the relative poverty that they I think it's they connected to the poverty because when the CARICOM countries, which is this social economic alliance and foreign policy, a bit like the European Union, came together with 15 countries, CARICOM, when they got their independence in the 60s and 70s, the cupboards were bare. A lot of these countries survived, barely survived the 70s and 80s. And today, many of the countries in the Caribbean have very high debt to GDP figures. So they find it very difficult to to actually raise money on the international market. But also they find it difficult to raise money for investment, investment in education, in health and economic development. You're a man from Dublin. You're a wealthy yep. individual. What's did you see from your experience in the Caribbean or from your experience just generally around the world that made you think that this is something that you need to put your uh, intellectual heft and, and also your money behind? Yeah, we've invested in 25 countries in the Caribbean, the poorest being Haiti. If you take Haiti today, the whole government budget is $1.8 billion. That's for 11 million people. Haiti was the first country in the Caribbean to get its independence in 1804, but the French blockaded Haiti and made them pay half their government income to the French government to buy their independence. So uh, the reason why I'm interested, because I'm an investor in Haiti, we've built uh, 198 schools in the country. If there's ever going to be change, it's now. Mm -hmm. I think there's a growing grassroots campaign. So the reason I'm interested in is this is because I've been in the Caribbean for so long. I've listened to people. I've listened to prime ministers, ministers, General, all or people, my staff saying, we never got proper reparatory justice, and they feel very strongly about this. And if you look at the way the, the British government financed and gave money to the slave owners, not the slaves, they pay that money, that debt. The British government has borrowed a substantial amount of money, about forty percent of the British government's budget at the time, the equivalent of that was borrowed and that money was only paid off in 2015. That sounds like it's a legacy of, of racism still. Of course it is. But I think the British government and the European Union cannot ignore this now because the Dutch government have already apologised to Suriname. They've set aside 100 million. You know, they're the first country to apologise. And the reason why Great Britain and many of the other countries that were involved in the slave trade, chattel slave trade, didn't apologise is because they didn't want to have a liability. 
But I suppose that's not the important thing. An apology is one thing, but I suppose is how do you spur economic and social development mm. in these countries? How can Jamaica become a knowledge based economy? How does it move away from all inclusive tourism, from a very thin economy to an economy that is more broad based? If we accept the premise that these countries do have a, a responsibility, mm -hmm. perhaps a duty to give some money back to the nations that they were involved with in the slave trade, where does that liability end? Is it part of development aid? It's all down to negotiation between the 15 CARICOM states and the British government and the European Union. Portugal shipped nearly all the slaves over a 300 year period. Holland, Belgium, Germany, all of them participated in slavery. So it's a joint burden as such. We're not asking for a check up front for each country of compensation. We're saying that it should be paid out over 25 years. Then that money can be used as supplementary money in the budgets of each of these countries with a proper plan. After the break, we'll hear more from Dennis about what, in his view, delivery of reparations should look like. We're back with the repair campaign's Dennis O'Brien on how close he feels they are to their development of plans for restorative justice. We're probably about four to six months away from that. Okay. So we have... In your mind, what do you think it, it looks like? It looks, you know, like a certain amount of money every year, which is supplementary to the budget okay. of the country. It could be 10% of the budget, for example. This was a Holocaust that went on for 300 years. You know, millions of people lost their lives. Nobody has ever apologized to these countries. We're in a moderate way saying this is how you can make up for that. What conversations are you having with the British government right now? None at the moment. We've had preliminary conversations with the European Union. The 15 plans for each of the CARICOM countries have to be approved by the cabinet, the opposition, but also the reparatory justice committee in that country. Mm -hmm. So we're in that process at the moment. We're working with the University of West Indies on the on the economic and social development plans. Can you understand the argument against saying sorry and against offering well, I, reparations? Well, I, 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 can, I can't really, to be honest with you, well, because it's evidence-based. It's, it's, budgets, are, it's budgets, are very, budgets are very tight. This generation of people are in no way responsible for what their ancestors did and shouldn't therefore be punished or uh, well, made to go into their pockets for something that people hundreds of years ago did. You take a taxi from Heathrow all the way into town, every significant building, every museum, every large scale business in this country was, f and universities particularly, mm. was funded out of slavery. So I don't think people, I mean, it's a dead argument. It's dead on arrival for people to say that there should be no reparatory justice. There has never been a better time for people to actually sit up on their chairs and say, how do we make amends for a brutal period of history? This went on for 300 years. Millions of people lost their lives. Millions of people were taken against their will from West Africa, put on ships for three months. 20% of them died on that uh, voyage. And when they got there, they were taken off of a ship and sold. And they, showed us ch they were sold as chattel slaves. And then their offspring, they were chattel slaves as well. So, you know, it was an appalling period of history. Does there need to be more conversation about it? Because I, I do wonder if you, I don't know if you've done polling on it. We've done focus groups in the United Kingdom. All and, and, how do they, and how do they come out? People said, oh, this money will be used, you know, by governments and they will be corrupt and they won't use the money properly. Now, that is a form of racism in my mind because they're being judgmental on the ability of these countries and these governments to properly use reparatory justice money. So, we, But doesn't it speak to public opinion and, the, and then to why the political class aren't I, willing to, to I, get behind I, it? I think uh, when we go and explain to the British public what this is all about and what we're trying to achieve, I think uh, that opinion will change dramatically. Governments don't do anything without public opinion. So obviously, from our point of view, we have to rally public opinion here in the United Kingdom for us to be successful in achieving reparatory justice. A person like yourself, mm -hmm. yeah. white people involved in, yeah. in this kind of... It's the, elephant in the it's the elephant in the room. I mean, it's the obvious <laughs> thing, isn't it? Right? You've heard of the white saviour complex. Yes. Is there, 
Is there an element of that that well, you, look, you guys are feeling guilty about what happened? Well, sorry, I don't feel any guilt, obviously, because I, my my ancestors didn't benefit from slavery or economically in any way from from slavery. So, you know, look, I, I'm I feel part of the Caribbean. I've been going to the Caribbean for 25, 26 years. I have so many friendships all over the Caribbean. I've been involved through our foundation in funding, you know, education, you know, early education, but also disability. I have a, a very strong connection and affinity to the Caribbean. I don't see just because I'm white why I shouldn't obviously put a campaign together for reparatory justice. Now, I wanted to put Dennis's thoughts to our academic and activist, Dr. Angelique Nixon, who you heard from earlier. Listen, billionaires have to think about these things for their own, I think, their their own moral (laughs) future. If billionaires are going to do that work and think through it and think about where their money has come from, there have been a few different unveilings because of the work done on the the legacies of British slave ownership in particular and where that money went and the horrific unveiling of the fact that so many families, so many British families made a, a lot of money after the transatlantic slave trade ended. I think that if billionaires like O'Brien, want to do this work and figure out a pathway to reinvest these funds and do it in a way that is equitable and grounded in a sense of reparative justice and that is in conversation with CARICOM countries, then I'm all for it. But I want to make sure that that is coming from a place where folks are at the table in the decision making. I think it's really important that communities are at the heart of these decisions I don't think that Caribbean governments and billionaires should be making these decisions on their own because, frankly, they are at the source of power. This has been a renewed interest in reparations. What do you put that down to? And as it's a renewed interest, does it give you more optimism that an outcome that is fair and equitable could well come from this renewed interest in reparations and restorative justice this time? Uh, across the region with Barbados uh, moving to Republic status. And it seems that Jamaica is also going to be moving that way. I think that's a part of that, pro- that renewed interest and communities saying, listen, we have been experiencing this injustice for far too long. It's also the case that I think as, especially across the English speaking Caribbean, different anniversaries of independence are happening and just as we reflect and look at, okay, where are we in the, in that process of building our spaces? I think that folks are saying, look, we, we can make that connection. And there's still so many places that we don't, we're still dealing with so many of those historical injustices. I think that in the last, I would say in the last five years that's been building that we have so many young people who are demanding more demanding more of leaders but entire communities are saying wait we we have to do something and I think that that some of our fierce leaders who are standing up uh you know to say we need and, and our and our fierce activists across the region are saying we need a different way of thinking about this and the time is now well it's beyond time really You've been listening to the Sky News Daily with me, Kamali Melbourne. My thanks to Dr. Angelique Nixon, Dr. Cassandra Gupta and Dennis O'Brien.